Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Walker, and uh, I'd like to present to everybody today uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Song. He's a visiting professor, and he's coming from the Asan Medical Center, which is one of the top centers there in South Korea. And he is going to share with us some of his experiences, um, which I think are going to really speak to novel ideas, how to incept them, how to start bringing them into translation and to see their integral development over time. Um, I've seen parts of this talk. It's a beautiful talk. Um, so Dr. Son is going to present uh, his experiences in developing GI stent and other stents um, titled 30 Years of Intervention from the Mind to the Global Stent Market. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Song, it's yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Walker, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a reflection on my personal history in the research world. First, let's briefly review the historical aspect of development in esophageal stand technology. When I was an assistant professor at Cheonbuk National University in 1987, I used esophageal tubes such as the Celestin tube and the Wilson Cook tube for palliative treatment of patients with inoperable esophageal cancer. But it was really difficult to place the tubes in a narrowed esophagus, particularly in patients who had radiation therapy because the outer diameter of the delivery system was 25 millimeters. So its esophageal rupture rate was as high as 11%. I still vividly remember how difficult this was. I would toss and turn the night before the procedure worried about esophageal rupture and failure. Later that year, I read this article on percutaneous endovascular self-expandable G-stand, which deeply impressed me. I was so excited that I visited doctors Ken Wright and Sidney Wallace at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston for one month after 1988 RSNA conference. Dr. Wright was kind enough to show me how to fashion the Z stand. It was not that difficult, but it was a tremendous lucky break for me. After returning home with the necessary instrument, I set up a small machinery shop in the corner of my office and worked day and night at to devise a covered stand. I coated and covered the stand with different kind of materials on and on until I designed this silicone covered stand. My G stand was constructed of a stainless steel wire in a cylindrical zigzag configuration. It was 10 millimeters in diameter and 20 millimeters long. It had two bulbs to prevent stent migration. First, I wrapped the outside of the bare stent with a nylon mesh and dipped it into a silicone rubber solution. We deployed the stent and the esophagi of 10 rabbit for up to eight weeks. These are esophagrams obtained immediately after and eight weeks after stent placement these are gross specimens of this rabbit eight weeks after stent placement. Here you can see the stented esophageal lumen is dilated, but free of perforation. With this, I received a small grant from the Radiological Research Foundation of Korea, which became the seed money for my research. In 1991, we reported the first covered metallic stent placement in the human esophagus. We placed the 19 millimeters curved G stent with the two bulbs, which I fashioned myself. In eight 
patient with the use of a 12 millimeter silicon delivery system under local anesthesia. There was no esophageal rupture or stent migration. This was my first patient. Here you can see obstruction of the distal esophageal lumen because gastric cancer extended to the esophagastric junction. Here you can see opening of the lumen immediately after stent placement. Also, the first generation stent had a larger internal diameter than the conventional tubes. It had a far lower profile delivery system because the stent could be compressed into a 12 millimeter delivery system. However, it was almost impossible to remove the stent when it caused complications such as severe pain in this patient because of risk of bob related complications. To overcome this problem, we designed the second generation stent. Instead of bobs, we made the proximal and distal part of the stent eight millimeters wider than the better part to prevent the stent migration and placed the stent in 119 patients with malignant or benign strictures. The esophageal perforation rate was 0%, but the migration rate was 10% and as high as 32% at the esophagastric junction. Here's an example of downward stent migration. In this patient with distal esophageal cancer, extending to the esophagastric junction, we pressed the second stent because the first stent had migrated into the duodenum two months after stent placement. Here you can see progressive downward migration of the first stent in the ileum and here in the ascending colon. It passed through the rectum eight months after stent placement. If the stent had been designed for retrieval, however, we would have been able to remove the stent once in the duodenum. After this experience, we designed a polyurethane covered retrievable stent. To make the stent removable, we attached nylon drawstrings at the upper inner margin of the stent. These were the tools for their removal, a 13 French dilate and shears and hook wire. To remove the stent, after grasping the nylon drawstring with the hook, we threw the hook wire into the shears to collapse the proximal end of the stent, and then the entire assembly was removed altogether. To improve the flexibility of the stent and to decrease the size of their delivery system, we decided to make a nitinol stent because of the limitations of using stainless steel wire. You, I can explain what's the difference between stainless steel wire and nitinol wire. After tri uh, trial and error for three years, we designed three more generations of esophageal stent. The first generation was somewhat rigid and ice water was needed for stent placement because the nitrile wire used for constructing the stent had a temperature dependent shear memory. So we dipped the stent into ice water to load into the nine millimeter delivery system before stent placement. The stent collapsed in the ice water and expanded to is preset expanded the diameter at the body temperature after stent placement. The fifth and sixth generations were very flexible and ice water uh, was not no longer needed because non-temperature dependent super elasticity was used for construction. Again, Nitinol wire has two functions. One is temperature dependent shear memory. The other is non-temperature dependent super elasticity. That's why 
nitinol wire has a lot of advantage in comparison with uh, stainless wire. Contrary to our expectation and published data, recurrent symptoms due to tumor ingrowth occurred in this patient with curved esophageal stent. Here you can see a widely patent stent after stent placement, but at four months after stent placement, both esophagram and endoscopic photogram show narrowing of the distal esophageal lumen because of tumor ingrowth. I emphasize that this is a curved stent which can prevent the tumor ingrowth, but here you can see tumor ingrowth. What happened? Any idea? Dr. Taeyong, you are on the line? Yeah, there's uh, most likely gastric gastric acid eroding at it. How how it is possible? This is esophagus. Oh, reflux, huh? Reflux can come back. Yeah, yeah, it, that's good. Uh, we removed the digit two stent from the esophagus two months after stent placement. The upper one was placed in the thoracic esophagus above the esophagastric junction the low one bridging the esophagastric junction. So this part of the stent was located in the gastric fundus for two months. Here you can see disruption of the covering membrane after exposure to highly acidic gastric fluid. But here you can see a small amount of disruption. This stent was placed above the esophagastric junction. So you can see the difference. Theon, again, what's the problem, this one? This is uh, also due to reflux. Oh, um, it's right by the gastric junction? Uh, uh, actually, when it caused by the reflux or disruption due to acidic acid or hydrolytic enzyme from the biliary tree. Disruption is like this, but this is different. So this is a mechanical uh, problem. When we load the stent into the delivery system, it, 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 this kind of things can happen. But now we use different kind of materials, okay? Uh, after this experience, we designed the seventh generation stent. We curved the stent with the PTF pre-membrane sutured to both ends of the stent. So this is a polyurethane, this is a PTF. -E. In our experience, 0.6% of removed seventh generation stent showed separation of membrane. Here is an example. In this patient with the diffuse esophageal cancer, the follow-up study shows a widely patent stent, but at three weeks, here you can see irregular narrowing of the stent lumen due to separation of the membrane from the nitinol wire, causing obstruction of the lumen. To solve the problem and to create a stent with less migration and with better conformability, we designed eight generations stent, particularly for patients with tortuous distal esophageal cancer or recurrent cancer after gastrectomy with gastrojejunostomy. Here you can see tortuosity. So we designed the eight generation stent. To prevent the stent migration, both ends of the stent had two shoulders. To improve the conformability, we just covered the outside of the middle part of the stent with Dacron. Dacron is different from polyurethane. We also have developed five generations of gastroduodenal stent. In 1991, we reported the first gastric stent placement in a patient with recurrent cancer after distal gastrectomy with gastrojejunostomy. You can see 
opening of the lumen after stent placement. In 1993, we reported percutaneous gastric stent placement in a patient with gastric cancer involving the gastric outlet. We placed the stent through a surgical gastrostomy, and here you can see good flow of contrast medium. At that time, per oral placement of a stent into the gastric outlet or into the duodenum was not possible in patients with no previous gastric surgery because the 12 millimeter stent delivery system was too large and rigid. Now it is possible with the use of fifth generation stent, dual gastroduodenal stent, which need 3.8 millimeter delivery system. Here you can see a big difference between the first and this one. The dual stent consists of two stents, the outer stent and inner bare nitro stent. The outer stent has three parts, the proximal and distal nylon uh, stent. This is bare stent and then nylon mesh. First, we press the outer stent so that the nylon mesh fully covers the stricture and then press the inner bare nitro stent. So this stent needs two delivery system. We developed seven generations of colorectal stent. Here are non other non-vascular stent, such as a tracheobronchial stent, biliary stent, lacrimal stent, urethral stent, and prostatic stent. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I started my research at Chumbung National University in 1989 by setting up a small machinery shop and raising dogs in a farmer's house because my alma mater university didn't have large animal facilities. So I brought the dogs from a farmer house to the hospital to conduct experimental study on weekend. And then from time to time, I visited a hardware shop to find appropriate tubes for building stent delivery system because there was no medical device company in Korea at the time. My machinery shop was humble to say the least. Uh, for example, I just uh, pick up the table from a garbage dump the other instrument cost less than 100 US dollars. I moved to Asa Medical Center in 1993. This slide shows our research laboratory in Asa Medical Center in 1999. Thanks to grant, we had a fancy machinery shop and clean room with uh, spotless benches and excellent large animal facilities and mobile CM. What about manpower? In the beginning, one radiographer and I did all animal studies, but by 1999, we had wonderful manpower. Many doctors from abroad visited our research laboratory to learn how to make a stand. Uh, this is Dr. Lopera, who visited me for one month in 1997. So we have built a friendship. On April 20th, 2000, my friend Dr. Gang and I founded SNG Biotech with four other partners. The initial capital outlay was 100,000 US dollars. So I became the first CEO of SNG Biotech. In the meantime, 51 Korean radiologists joined us as stockholders. At first, I was concerned about their participation because I was afraid that our venture company would go bankrupt. 
With this small step, SNG started and moved on, but it was really hard and inefficient to do research work and to run a company at the same time. So we formed a strategic cooperation with Taeyong, which was responsible for sales and SNG research and development. Two years later, I quit the chairmanship of SNG as required by university rules and passed the chairmanship to Dr. Kang, who is still is the CEO. I have received many prestigious awards in Korea and abroad. For example, the Grand Prix winner from Korean Medical Association to celebrate is 100th anniversary and the most distinguished scientist from President Lee myung Bak, and honorary membership from European Congress of Radiology, RSNA, Chinese Society of Interventional Radiology, and British Society of Interventional Radiology, and Japanese Radiological Society, and gold medal award from SIR 2016. It was a sheer joy and honor for me. This table shows the list of top 10 imported medical devices in Korea in 2010 and 2011. The number one item was stent, followed by CT and MRI. This slide shows the list of top 16 exported medical devices in Korea. The number 16 item was a stent. Furthermore, the majority of exported stents were non-vascular stents. In other words, our team has contributed greatly to export of medical stent. Korean government realized that medical technology can be a nucleated field for Korean economy for the future and chose 10 university hospitals, including as a medical center to encourage cooperation between industry and hospitals. This Korean government effort came to me an unexpected but cheerful outcome. As a me medical center allowed me to set up the Interventional Medicine Research and Development Center in 2014. Take a look at the result. By 2019, 30 years after developing the stent concept, this table shows our weekly timetable for research at that time, including lymphatic research, obesity treatment devices, drug releasing stent, and application of nanoparticles in the robotic delivery system. This table shows our short-term, mid-term, and long-term plan. Probably you remember this slide. I made a similar plan for your department. I had strived to find the most effective problem solving options in translational research for the first five years. And here are six leaders in each field who are designing the mid-term and long-term plan. We have conducted national and international research together with several institutes, such as Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago in the state, and the Christ National Research Foundation Trust in Manchester in the UK and Peking University in China and Seoul National University, KAIST, Yihua, Ina, and Jambung National University. SNG Biotech is actively involved in research. 
Here are five tips on doing research from my personal experience. First, building close relations with the patient is the name of the game in clinical research. Uh, this elderly male patient with recurrent esophageal cancer after chemo radiation therapy had three stents. The first one with short barbs migrated downward and passed through the rectum two months after stent placement. The another first-generation stent with short barbs migrated upward because the barb was short and was removed through his mouth. The last one with two shoulders, that is second-generation stent, did not migrate until his death. I remember his sincere cooperation. Thanks to his cooperation, I was able to design the second-generation stent. Our relationship was similar to that of a father and his son. The majority of my ideas have come from patients. In short, listen to your patients and you will learn from them. Your patients can be your teachers. Second, it is very important to collaborate with the physicians and scientists in other disciplines because invaluable ideas emerge from the interaction of different disciplines. I have met more than 50 PhDs to co collaborate in the development of eight generations of esophageal stent. Without their passion and contribution, this would not have been possible. Third, try to find the mentors and keep in touch with them. It is said that if a scholar has one mentor in his or her academic career, their life is successful. Fortunately, I have at least 21 mentors during my academic career. Some of them are Korean, many of them are Americans, and some British people, and German, and Japanese, and Chinese. Every time I have met an obstacle or difficult situation, they have shared their great wisdom with me. I have learned a lot and grown much thanks to them. This slide shows how they shared their wisdom with me. In retrospect, I have had a severe depression period every seven years in my academic career. For example, when I moved to Asan Medical Center from my Alma University in 1993, I thought I would not have severe depression anymore because of such wonderful facilities, great academic activity, and the strong manpower in as a medical center. But I had another depression seven years after I moved to as a medical center. At that time, I got tenure from the university, but I tossed and turned my way through the night because of one problem that I could not solve. I really wanted to focus on research, but I could not do so because as a medical center put the top priority in clinical work. So I asked my mentors whether it was a good idea to move to the United States. Actually, I had offers to work from a hospital in the state. This is one of my mentors reply saying, don't leave Korea. You should stay where you are now because of these five problems. This is from Castaneda Juniga from Louisiana State University. Thanks to their stern advice, I was able to go back to clinical work and research. Another important strategy is to train new scholars and cooperate with them. 
I set up research meeting in 1994 in ASM Medical Center to collaborate with the physicians and scientists in, on, in other disciplines. This red line shows the amount of grant that our team has received annually from 1993 to 2020. The yellow line shows mine and the blue line represents the amount of grant that I assist my colleagues in obtaining. Here you can see the total amount of grant has increased a lot when I set up the research meeting in 1994 and set up the Interventional Medicine Development Center in 2014. My grant has been increasing for the first 10 years, then dropped. On the other hand, my colleagues were very active in conducting research at that time. When my colleagues became tired of doing research, I refocused my priorities back on doing research. Here you can see it's amazing. My colleagues are very active in doing research even after my retirement last year. So here you can say this is mine, the end, but they are active. The point is, it's very important to train new scholars and cooperate with them for your future. Finally, always thank your spouse and family, regardless of who you are, what you do, nothing is more important than your home because your heart can rest there. This is my wife. Here are my two sons and their families. They are my companions, healers, and friends who have shared and will share my dreams and hope together. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. I think that was a very inspiring talk and we're very happy to have you here. Unfortunately, we got COVID now, but Despite that, you've been helping us a lot with the research Air Force, and we hope we can show a similar graph showing how the research has increased since you came here to help us and sent in with the grants. So we're very happy to have you here. Okay, what a coincidence. Uh, you know that you have a professor grant, uh, which was uh, 4,000 US dollars, right? Coincidentally, my grant seed money was four thousand US dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. That's how yes. you want to start. I believe you have a wonderful team. So your future is very broad, bright, probably ten years from today. It, it will be totally different. You have a wonderful team. I, I don't know you noticed, Dr. Son, that research in this country is not easy, you know. Uh, probably many years ago doing research was easier because maybe there weren't so many red tape. But right now there's a lot of red tape and doing research is very hard, but still it's possible. And we want to keep going and doing it, but it's not easy, as you know. Ah, you, you can make it. Yeah, we can make it. Hey, hey Dr. Song, how do you think your research uh, affected your clinical work? and your clinical abilities. How do you think they interacted? Uh, excuse me, I didn't hear you. How do you think the research that you did affected your ability to do clinical work? Yeah. And was it helpful or not helpful? Helpful, helpful, for, because um, it, it's a, research is wonderful to bridge the uh, gap between clinical work and research work. For example, I have learned a lot, everything from uh, animal studies and then uh, started the clinical work. So all kinds of complications and the side effect was same. That's why I was very strong for me to do clinical work 
because I had a background from the animal study. Even though I have done a lot of clinical studies, I have never had any problem with the patient because I explained everything to the patient and, and their family. And then uh, including the possible complications. So even though there was some complications, they understood my position uh, and then they supported me. Yeah, so the background knowledge learned from the basic science, animal study is very important. Dr. I, I would agree. I think what I did uh, in my uh, animal research and uh, basic research had a lot of application to my clinical work. And also I have some seminal patients too, just like you that were uh, so understanding and they were uh, breakthrough patients, basically. And it's very good to work with them and know them closely. So I, so I like the flow model study because in Korea, some interventional radiology, they start from the patients. So it can cause complication, but in your hospital, the resident can do study first with the use of flow model and the learn so they can apply the knowledge of learned from the flow model to their clinical work, which is very important. Okay, Dr. Walker. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Dr. Song. Um, very inspirational beautiful talk i think it uh um i guess i guess i should be closing out the meeting but um just want to say i think uh a couple of highlights that i really enjoy from your talk is one uh seeing the number of iterations you know you you move forward with one uh modification thinking hey this is going to solve this problem and you find a new problem and you got to go back to the to the bench side figure out that problem and i think it's a uh, it's a testament to keep pushing forward to figure out those iterations until you get it uh, as perfected as possible and um, i mean even as it is now there's room for modification um, and so i think that's uh, one of the beauties of of what we do is there's always room to improve um, and then the other thing that uh, i think you did a great job of, of highlighting is just the experiences that you take in collaborations and mentorships and and having mentees along the way and uh, just the exponential power of having other people's minds and getting their enthusiasm together and uh, allowing each other person to explore in their strengths and helping each other in their weaknesses and it's just amazing when you work in that kind of atmosphere how much you can accomplish and I think you've accomplished an amazing amount um, by staying with those ideals. Okay. Uh, actually, I meet Dr. Taeyeon uh, once a week to study about stent. He is excellent. So if anyone wants to join us, please tell Dr. Taeyeon. Okay, Dr. Taeyeon, do you have any comment? No, I thought it was an outstanding talk. I mean, rarely do you get to hear um, anybody's experience, but 30 years in the stent or medicine industry, going from idea to industry to retirement and having mentees who are now leading the way. The thing I find most fascinating is just the, the uh, inventions, the patents, bring to market, bring it to patients. So. Uh, this is something that I would love to do as well. So I, I took a lot out of this talk. But uh, Dr. Lopera, you have wonderful people who have a great dream. Um, and then I I like to, to study with them. It's a really enjoyable thing. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. Thank you for coming and helping us. We really appreciate it.